Good afternoon. I want to welcome back those of you who caught our first segment in this two-part series on filtering for dynamic signals. If you happen to miss the first webinar or want a refresher on the information presented, you can find the recording on our website, www.pfinc.com, under Presentations and Videos in the Papers and Briefs drop-down. If you are new to Precision Filters, our company has been providing instrumentation for test measurements since 1975. We have a complete line of analog signal conditioning and switch system products. We also have a line of modules compatible with National Instruments CDAC and Serial platforms. Your host today is the president of Precision Filters, Doug Firth. Doug has 25 years experience designing and developing instrumentation for products sold in a wide variety of markets, including aerospace, energy and defense, and transportation. If you happen to have questions throughout the presentation, we encourage you to use the chat function. Doug will be taking a few questions at the end of his talk today. Thanks, Bridget. To recap what we discussed in part one, uh, in part one, we just defined uses and properties of filters and discussed how active filters are the best choice for measurement systems that require um, high degree of precision, accuracy, low noise, high stability, and good measurement bandwidth. Uh, we discussed components of the filter transfer function, namely the amplitude or uh, gain versus frequency response and the uh, phase versus frequency response. We talked about different filter types, the classical Butterworth and Bessel types, as well as uh, the flat elliptic and pulse mode filters that Precision Filters uh, currently offers in its products. We discussed linear phase and its importance uh, to faithful wave shape reproduction in the time domain. And we also had an example of how to set a filter transfer function in a measurement system to achieve criteria for wave shape reproduction. So today uh, we're going to discuss a third component of the filter transfer function and that is the transient response. Uh, we're going to talk about important filter specs and how to interpret a data sheet. We'll talk about the distributed gain amplifier topology, introducing an amplifier to the uh, signal chain, and discuss how to avoid signal clipping. We'll talk about components of noise, referred to input and referred to output noise, and how uh, spectral noise and broadband noise are, are related. Finally, we'll wrap it up with a discussion on aliasing and anti-alias filters. As a review, uh, the flat mode filters that Precision Filters offers in its products compare very favorably with the uh, industry standard Butterworth characteristics. In this, in this chart, we're comparing the LP8F 8-pole flat mode filter and the LP4F 4-pole flat mode filter against their Butterworth counterparts. And you can see that the passband flatness of these filters is equivalent to or better than the Butterworth where the roll-off, the, the rate of transition from passband to stop band, is much sharper than the Butterworth filter. So these filters are, are much more selective and represent great improvements over the, the industry standard Butterworth characteristic. Similarly, we offer a low-pass filter called a pulse mode characteristic. This characteristic has that linear phase property that's important for uh, time domain work time domain wave shape reproduction and we're comparing our linear phase pulse mode filter against the the standard Bessel filter. You can see that the passband of the two filters are nearly identical yet the roll-off of the pulse mode filter is superior to the Bessel um, almost down 80 dB at uh, 3.5 times the program cutoff uh, where the Bessel takes almost twice uh, that or 6.1 or 2 times the program cutoff to get to 80 dB. So for filter selection on your test, the flat mode filters have the best ampli amplitude response, gain versus frequency response. They have very flat passband, steep roll off, and they're a very good choice for frequency domain type measurements such as uh, uh, fast Fourier transforms. <coughs> 
they have a nonlinear phase. So for time domain type measurements, uh, really it's not a great choice to use the, the flat mode uh, characteristic or Butterworth characteristic. The pulse mode, on the other hand, have excellent phase linear linearity, uh, and that comes at a cost of some rounded uh, passband, some some attenuation in the uh, in the passband. Uh, the pulse mode filters are great choices for um, time domain measurements where you're trying to preserve uh, wave shapes of signals and wave shape reproduction of signals. There's a third attribute in the transfer function that we refer to as the transient response, and you must pay very careful attention to the transient response when you're making mechanical shock measurements or energetic uh, test uh, applications, such as ballistics or live fire um, or impact testing and other uh, transient or impulsive type measurements. I want to reemphasize that um, in the precision uh, instruments that the choice of transfer function uh, between flat, optimized for frequency dom domain, or pulse, more optimized for, for time domain measurements, is, um, is a programmable feature in our instruments. So a way to evaluate the transient response of a particular filter is to examine its step response. Step response is measured by applying a sudden DC input uh, to the filter and then measuring uh, the output response of that filter. The specs that we can look at uh, on the step response include the 50% delay time, and that's the time it takes uh, for the response on its initial rise to go from 0 to 50% of its final value. We can look at the rise time, uh, the time of the initial rise to go between 10 and 90 percent of the final value. We can look at a settling time to a specific uh, percentage and that's the time it required for the step function to reach and stay within a certain percentage of the final value. And finally we can look at uh, something we call the overshoot and that's the percentage that the, the step response exceeds its final value on the initial rise. So to illustrate some of these concepts, we have an indicial or a step response. I use the term indicial uh, response since the step response indicates the transfer function of the filter. We can differentiate the step response to get the impulse response and then take the inverse Laplace transform of the impulse response to get back to the transfer function of the filter. This particular step response is a highly underdamped step response it would not be a very good step response to use to, to measure um, uh, transient type uh, tests. So we see on this on this uh, response the 50 percent delay time, the 10 to 90 percent rise time, the large overshoot, and the ringing. And we measure the ringing to uh, where the, the value is within certain percentages of the final value. That's called the settling time. We were, we're indicating the 10% settling time and the 5% um, settling times on this chart. Here is a plot of the step response of the LP8P pulse mode low pass filter with linear phase and the LP8F flat mode filter. And we can see uh, right away that the LP8P has a much better behaved step response than the, than the flat mode filter. It has a uh, very good uh, rise time, uh, short delay time, very low overshoot, and it rapidly settles to its finer, final value with very little uh, ringing. Uh, the LP8F, on the other hand, has about 19% overshoot, um, lots of ringing, uh, resulting in longer settling times. And in general, this would be a, a poor choice uh, for a transient response measurement, uh, a shock measurement, where you're trying to maybe uh, ascertain the peak pressure value in a gun barrel or, or something like that. Uh, you sample at that first overshoot peak and you're making almost a 20% error. Um, why uh, does the LP8F have such poor overshoot? Well, it's a direct result in how abruptly we 
truncate the Fourier series of the unit step function. Uh, the pulse mode filter with its broadly rounded response uh, gently truncates that Fourier series and results in, uh, as a result, very little overshoot. You abruptly truncate the Fourier series and, and that results in something that's known as Gibbs phenomenon or Gibbs peak and um, that is what is is uh, the reason for that 20% overshoot that we see in the step function. Precision Filters publishes filter characteristic data sheets on our filter transfer functions and so we've talked about the amplitude response, the phase response, and the transient response and we embody all that information in a, a two-page spec sheet. <clears throat> on this spec sheet we see uh, tabulated the amplitude response, um, the phase response, and something called phase distortion, which is deviation from ideal phase response. Uh, we have the tabulated uh, step response that we just talked about, um, the group delay, which we talked about last uh, presentation. Uh, and there's charts on here that show um, how to calculate attenuation of aliases. Uh, versus sampling frequency, which we will discuss a little later in this presentation. So these uh, filter characteristic spec sheets are available on our website for download. There's other filter specifications that will show up on data sheets. One called amplitude accuracy, and that says how much the realized filter and hardware deviates from the theoretical amplitude response. Uh, at a given frequency or range of frequencies and the amplitude accuracy is usually specced in uh, decibels. We have amplitude and phase match and that says how well in amplitude uh, one channel of a filter matches to all the other channels. This would be uh, particularly important if you're trying to do cross correlations between sensors that you're measuring. Uh, you want every channel uh, that you're measuring uh, with in your measurement system to match otherwise you'll have artifacts uh, in the correlation due to the mismatch of the, the filters. Phase match says how well a particular filter matches any other filter in your uh, data system. Um, again this is important for cross correlation it's also important for applications like underwater acoustics and beamforming where you're trying to measure time of arrival of a, of a signal um, if the filters don't phase match, uh, you'll have uh, different times of arrival due to the mismatch in the filters. And then um, another spec is stop in attenuation. And that's the minimum attenuation uh, that we achieve in the realized filter over a range of frequencies or at a particular frequency. Usually uh, we would specify a maximum frequency for which the stop in attenuation applies. Thus far we've been focused primarily on the filter in the measurement uh, chain. And now we're going to add a, a programmable amplifier to the filter. And by adding the programmable amplifier, we'll be able to gain up uh, the signal of interest and use the filter to eliminate uh, signals that are outband that we don't want to measure. Precision Filters always distributes our amplifiers in a, in a uh, what we call a dis distributed gain uh, topology where we apportion some of the gain before the filter as pre-filter gain and some of the gain after the filter as post-filter gain. This allows us to set the pre-filter gain so that we do not overload or overrange on the signal plus outband energy at the input to the filter. We use the filter to eliminate that outband energy and then gain the in-band signal up the rest of the way to uh, achieve our desired volts per measurement unit at the output. We always include in our instruments an overload detector at the input of the programmable filter because an overload condition uh, that occurs um, anywhere within an amplifier will really destroy your data. Uh, you'll have uh, signal creation, nonlinearity, and you can have uh, DC shifts in the data when the signal overloads in the filter. The filter um, will mask an overload condition at its input 
um, it can um, the output of the filter may look like a perfectly reasonable signal um, but the input could be overloaded and if you don't have an overload detector built in the the amplifier you would never know so we always include a pre-filter overload detector uh, with our instruments as an illustration of of signal clipping and what can occur we'll just take a simple quarter strain gauge bridge where we desire to measure uh, a full scale of 2000 microstrain and we calculate that with a gauge factor of 2 in a quarter bridge configuration and 10 volts of excitation that we require a channel gain of 2000 uh, to give us 10 volts uh, full scale out for 2000 microstrain. Now uh, in a normal situation where we don't have any noise coupling into our circuit, uh, we'll have sinusoidal uh, strain uh, measurement and we'll get a nice clean uh, signal out. But now if we subject the, the input uh, wiring and sensor to noise, um, the noise riding on the signal, first of all, in the time domain, we can't even see our signal or really make, make it out. But we also notice uh, that in, in our amplifier, which has plus or minus 10 volts of uh, signal swing maximum, that there's portions of this green signal trace that are exceeding the maximum signal swing of the amplifier. When that happens, we call that clipping. And when clipping hap happens, um, we have uh, what I described in the previous slide, nonlinearity, uh, in the amplifier, we can have signal creation due to this nonlinearity and uh, DC uh, level shift due to the uh, clipping. So we do not want to have clipping. Clipping invalidates our, our data. So one thing we can do to avoid the clipping is to cut back on our gain. And in this example, we cut the gain back to a factor of 200 and now uh, the signal plus noise does not hit the uh, maximum signal swing or those red horizontal lines in the amplifier. We're good. We don't have clipping now. But the problem with this is that we had, it, had to, to leave uh, 20 dB additional headroom in our amplifier and our downstream A to D to prevent the clipping. So our signal to noise ratio because of, of uh, having to leave this headroom is not going to be optimal. So if we add a low pass filter and a post filter gain stage uh, to our topology or the precision distributed uh, amplifier topology that we talked about, we can handle uh, this out band noise. What we do is we set the pre-filter amplifier to a gain of 200. We filter out the outband um, noise that we do not want to measure. And then we gain up the signal the rest of the way uh, with a post-filter gain of 10 so that we achieve an overall gain of 2,000. And we uh, see a nice clean uh, signal on the output that's gained up um, as we desire. So this illustrates uh, the importance of the distributed gain topology and how you can deal with a situation where you have uh, outband noise that's larger than the signal you're trying to measure. This can often happen in underdamp transducers such as accelerometers that have very high cues. Um, you're, you're measuring shock with a sensor and it's easy for that shock impulse to excite that outband energy and create uh, signals at the output of the sensor that are larger than the in-band uh, signal you're trying to measure. Important to have a filter with distributed gain to combat that. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, to protect against outband signals that are larger than in-band signals, you must have the gain uh, separated into pre-filter gain and post-filter gain around the filter. We'll set the pre-filter gain so as not to clip on, on the outband energy plus in-band energy. We'll filter out that outband energy with the low-pass filter and gain up the rest of the way with the post-gain uh, so that we reach our required full-scale output, signal output. Okay, we're going to shift gears now and talk about um, circuit noise and some terms that are used 
to specify noise in uh, filter amplifiers. We want to introduce some terms for noise specs. Uh, spectral noise is the spectral noise density at a given frequency and it's um, expressed in nanovolts per root hertz. So the spectral noise is useful when we're uh, evaluating noise of um, a particular instrument and we're doing frequency domain uh, measurements. The broadband noise is um, the uh, RMS noise in the time domain evaluated over a specified range of frequencies or bandwidth. The noise referred to the input is noise that would be um, amplified by any channel gain that we apply uh, to the signal chain and that is uh, also called the equivalent input noise of the amplifier filter. This can be expressed either as spectral or broadband noise. The noise referred to the output is noise that's present on the output that's independent of the channel gain. So it's always there uh, whether we apply a unity gain or a gain of a thousand. And that's also expressed either as spectral or broadband noise. There's, there's something called the noise equivalent bandwidth that um, compares the actual filter that we're using to uh, one of a brick wall in, in, uh, with a We want to introduce some terms for noise specs. Uh, spectral noise is the spectral noise density at a so active uh, circuits that we've been talking about, active filters, active amplifiers, generally have um, spectral noise that has two primary components. One would be the low frequency component, which varies as 1 over F, that's sometimes, sometimes called the uh, flicker noise of the circuit. And then we have the medium to high frequency component um, that is flat versus frequency in general. Uh, and that would be the white noise uh, component of the circuit. And where the breakpoint is between the flicker noise and the white noise is the 1 over F corner. Um, typical devices today have a 1 over F corner um, of in the order of 10 to 100 hertz. The spectral noise and the broadband noise are related by an integral. Uh, where the, the broadband noise is the square root of the spectral noise uh, squared integrated over a range of frequencies. So if we started with a spectral noise density as shown below where um, we have a breakpoint at 100 hertz and our white noise portion, portion is 7 nanovolts per root hertz uh, and someone asked us to estimate what the broadband noise would be uh, from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz, how would we answer this question? <clears throat> well, the area under the spectral noise curve is the broadband noise. And we're evaluating the broadband noise from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz. We notice that the area under the curve from 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz is going to dominate um, any portion of the noise below 100 hertz. So a good approximation to the broadband noise from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz is simply the area under that rectangle. Um, and that is 7 nanovolts per hertz times the square root of the bandwidth, 100 kilohertz. And we come up with a 2.21 microvolts RMS. Often we're in the lab um, with an oscilloscope and we're trying to measure noise. With an oscilloscope it's easier to interpret the noise as peak to peak uh, rather than RMS. And for a uh, white noise source which has a, a normal distribution, the one sigma noise level is the RMS noise. Uh, commonly accepted in the industry is um, a definition of peak-to-peak -peak noise equal to 6.6 .6 times the RMS noise level. At 6.6 .6 times the RMS noise level, the, the noise waveform will be uh, less than this level 99.9% .9 of the time. <clears throat> 
There's another term called the crest factor, which is uh, defined as the ratio of the peak-to-peak -peak noise to RMS noise. So uh, the crest factor of, of uh, a white noise source is 6.6. In combining uh, multiple uncorrelated noise sources, uh, we add those noise sources uh, geometrically or as the root sum squared. That is true for uh, RMS noise sources or spectral noise sources. This equation is, is very handy uh, when we're trying to combine RTI uh, related noise and RTO related noise because the RTI and RTO noise components uh, can be considered uncorrelated. <coughs> noise equivalent bandwidth. So to estimate how much noise uh, in the broadband sense goes through a filter, um, we can use the concept of noise equivalent bandwidth. Uh, and this chart shows the noise equivalent bandwidth for um, uh, a single pole filter all the way up to our eight pole flat and pulse filters. The noise equivalent bandwidth of the single pole filter is 1.56. Uh, the flat and pulse mode filters almost have a, uh, a noise equivalent bandwidth of 1, which is uh, what a uh, theoretical brick wall filter would have. So as an example, if you took a, a real pole, single real pole filter with a cutoff of 1 hertz, it has a, a noise equivalent bandwidth to a brick wall filter that would be set at 1.56 hertz. Okay, an example will help to put all the things that we're, we just talked about on the last uh, few slides uh, together. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you here. I'm hoping that um, you're following along. Um, but this uh, presentation will be available uh, to uh, look at on our website uh, so you can go back over it again. But let's suppose we had an amplifier with the following specs. Noise RTI, 7 nanovolts per root hertz. Um, that would be above a breakpoint of 100 hertz. Noise RTO, 200 microvolts RMS. That's measured from 3 hertz to 100 kilohertz. The gain setting is 50. The filter, which we'll assume is a 2-pole Butterworth, is set to 40 kilohertz. And the question is, what is the RMS noise at the output of the amplifier from 3 hertz to 100 kilohertz? <clears throat> well, the RMS noise would be the square root of the uncorrelated noise sources. So we would take the RTI portion, uh, multiply that by the gain. So we take 7 nan nanovolts per root hertz, multiply it by the gain, multiply it by the square root of the cutoff frequency times the noise equivalent bandwidth, square that whole term, and then add to it the noise RTO component uh, squared, and then take the square root of that whole thing. So at the bottom we have 7 nanovolts per root hertz times 50 times the square root of 40 kilohertz times 1.11 the noise equivalent bandwidth of a two pole Butterworth filter, that squared. We take 60 microvolts, the noise RTO, square that, add it together, take the square root, and we get 95 microvolts RMS. So you can, um, again, go back and, and check this uh, at your leisure um, by looking at the uh, presentation on our website. Okay, we'll shift gears again and uh, talk about uh, aliasing and anti-alias filters. So the aliasing problem is um, if we digitize an analog input signal, we can have uh, a sample data record that can be, be produced by signals other than the one we're trying to measure. Uh, those signals we refer to as aliases. So here's uh, an example of a, a 1 hertz waveform and a 4 hertz waveform um, sampled at a rate of 5 hertz. These two waveforms, these two sinusoids, have the same uh, sample data record. 
we would say that the 4 hertz uh, waveform in the, uh, is an alias of uh, 1 hertz, assuming 1 hertz is what we're trying to measure. More generally, the aliases of a signal we'll call F sub A are uh, equal to N times the sampling frequency uh, big of F sub S plus or minus F A, where N is an integer um, and F S, as we said, is a sampling frequency. So we can um, look at the uh, aliases of F A, our signal of interest. Um, aliases, the aliases being FB through FG and they're equal to integer multiples of FS plus or minus FA. Uh, to, re to remember this, uh, we can take a completely folded spectrum um, where everything folds between DC or zero and half the sampling frequency and take a pin and prick it through that uh, folded spectrum at uh, frequency FA. And then as we unfold uh, the spectrum, uh, the hole where we pricked uh, that folded spectrum will reveal uh, the other aliases of FA, the FB through FC. And as we can see in this chart, we've uh, partially unfolded the spectrum. And when we, when we completely unfold it and create a frequency axis, it shows us uh, um, clearly the aliases of uh, the, of our signal of interest FA uh, shown on the frequency axis. So this is how I remember uh, the aliasing uh, formula um, graphically depicted in, in this way. Aliases are particularly insidious because once we've sampled data uh, with aliases it's impossible to reconstruct the data unless we know exactly and precisely what the aliases were um, when we recorded. So there's no amount of analysis or, or post-data um, processing that we can do to separate the signal from the aliases. Fortunately, we have the sampling theorem uh, called the Nyquist theorem or the Shannon sampling theorem. And it states that if a function of time uh, contains no frequency higher than half the sampling frequency, then it is completely determined by the uh, sampled data record uh, with a sampling frequency of F sub S. So to restate the sampling theorem to emphasize aliasing, sam sampling theorem states that the sampling frequency must be at least twice the highest frequency of interest and that if any spectral content in the signal exists higher than half the sampling frequency you need to sufficiently attenuate it prior to the digitizing process or it will corrupt the signal we're trying to measure. So that second part really defines the the need uh, for an anti-aliasing low-pass filter to attenuate signals that exist higher than half the sampling frequency. So in our block diagram of our digitizer, we now have an anti-aliasing filter on the front end that will sufficiently attenuate any spectral content in our analog input signal, F sub T, such that uh, it will not alias and corrupt our, our in-band measurement. So the ideal anti-aliasing filter would look like a brick wall. It would have a perfectly flat passband at the cutoff frequency. It would have infinite attenuation slope uh, where it reaches a stop band at half the sampling frequency and then has infinite attenuation uh, above half the sampling frequency. <clears throat> In addition, it would have phase that varies linearly with frequency. However, such a filter is not realizable. So to do a uh, realizable filter, we have to have a transition region, as we've seen in the filters we've studied. Uh, that's a finite uh, attenuation slope from passband to stop band. Uh, the passband may have uh, uh, some amount of atten attenuation as you get close to the cutoff frequency. Uh, 
And then the stop band itself also has a finite amount of uh, attenuation. So in order to deal with the uh, practical anti aliasing filter uh, in that it doesn't have an infinite attenuation slope, a sampling frequency higher than twice the highest frequency of interest will be necessary. So using a practical anti-alias filter, um, how do we choose the cutoff frequency to achieve uh, the maximum attenuation of aliases or the required attenuation of aliases for a given sampling frequency? Well, looking at the process of aliasing in the frequency domain, the sampling process creates images of the, the baseband spectrum that are replicated at multiples of integer multiples of the sampling frequency. And those images uh, where they fold back into the baseband image is where aliasing occurs. And, and that is uh, happening in the shaded region of this diagram. We can see aliasing uh, occurring uh, in the transition region of uh, the signal at baseband. So the first method to set the cutoff frequency of the anti-aliasing filter is the method that allows for aliasing in the transition region of the filter. In this case, uh, the signal of interest is from uh, DC to the cutoff frequency, F sub C. And we're allowing the first image of, of the spectrum caused by the sampling process back into uh, the baseband uh, spectrum, DC to FC, um, with aliases being attenuated by the minimum stop band attenuation of the filter. So, uh, Writing the equation, we want to set uh, half the sampling frequency equal to the cutoff frequency plus the stop band frequency minus the cutoff frequency over 2. And that yields uh, uh, setting the cutoff frequency equal to the sampling frequency divided by 1 plus uh, omega, which is the shape factor, the filter. Omega is the ratio of the stop band frequency S sub B to the cutoff frequency that defines uh, uh, the sharpness of the filter. So omega equal 1 is a brick wall filter um, for the LP8F, which is um, 80 dB down at 1.77 times the cutoff frequency. Omega would simply equal 1.77. The second method uh, does not allow aliases to fold back in the uh, signal region nor uh, in the transition region. Uh, all aliases are attenuated by the minimum stop band attenuation of the filter. And this condition uh, says we need to set the sampling frequency over 2 equal to the stop band frequency. That yields setting the cutoff frequency to uh, the sampling frequency divided by 2 times the shape factor of the filter. So in our filter spec sheets, and we saw um, an example of a, a precision filter spec sheet earlier in this presentation, we include graphs that show attenuation of aliases versus sampling frequency. And these graphs assume the criterion is method one. And there's an additional variable uh, that needs to be determined, and that is how much attenuation at the highest frequency of interest can you tolerate in your data. So let's say that we can attenuate or, or handle attenuation of 3 dB at the highest frequency of interest. Uh, we want 80 dB minimum attenuation of aliases. Uh, reading off this chart, it says that we need to sample at about 2.74 uh, times the highest frequency of interest. If we want no more than 0.1 dB attenuation of the signal and um, 80 dB uh, minimum attenuation of aliases, this ch reading off this chart, it says we need to uh, sample at about 3.05 uh, times the highest frequency of interest. And this, this uh, chart represents uh, curves for the LP8F, the sharpest uh, filter that we offer. Now, um, this particular chart 
uh, shows a comparison of sample rates required for different filter types, the LP8F and LP4F, the 8 and 4 pole flat mode filters, and then the 8 and 4 pole pulse mode filters. And you can see uh, from this chart that if we want no more than 0.1 dB attenuation of the signal, it drives a sample rate of 3.05 times the highest frequency of interest. We saw that in the prior slide. Um, for the four pole filter, flat mode filter, it drives a, a higher, much higher sample rate because it's not as sharp, uh, 10.3 times the highest frequency of interest. And then the pulse mode filters get, get even higher than that. The eight pole pulse mode filter is 20.3. The four pole is 66.3 times the highest frequency of interest to get 80 dB minimum attenuation of aliases and no more than 0.1 dB attenuation of the signal. If we can handle more attenuation of the signal, 3 dB attenuation of the signal, then the sampling rates come down as one would expect. So going down this chart, the 8 pole flat is 2.75, 4 pole flat 6.75, 8 pole pulse 4.47, and 4 pole pulse mode 12.8 times the highest frequency of interest. Many data acquisition systems use a type of analog to digital converter called the sigma delta converter. And this is a type of oversampling analog to digital converter. The input sampling rate is typically 64, 128, or even 256 times um, the effective output sampling rate. So given that we have such a, a, a huge input sampling rate, it greatly simplifies the complexity of the analog filter we need to prevent aliasing. In fact, often we can get away with just a single pole, simple single pole analog filter. So after uh, oversampling the output of that analog filter, internal to the converter, there is a, a sharp uh, digital filter applied to the data. And this is an algorithm that's applied to the sampled uh, data. After the sharp digital filter is applied, um, you decimate by a, a factor of k, whatever the sample oversampling ratio was, and you end up with an output sampling rate of, of f sub s. So there's a couple problems with oversampling converters. Uh, one is, is that their huge input bandwidth uh, means that all the, the energy in the signal, the in-band plus out-band energy of the signal, is, shows up at the input of the sigma delta converter. And if the signal has lots of out-of-band energy, it can easily saturate uh, the converter. Once you saturate the converter, um, the data is, is no good for that time, plus uh, the time for that uh, saturated condition to clear out of the filter, uh, the digital filter. Another problem with this type of converter is that they generally have uh, poor transient response, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. So to emphasize the first point, the signal-to-noise ratio on the signal input must be favorable, or if it's not, if you have a lot of out-of-band energy in your signal, it will easily saturate the sigma delta converter due to its huge uh, input bandwidth. So to, to com combat that, um, you need to use a more complex filter, one that's got more poles, like a uh, the ones we've been studying, uh, the LP4 or LP8 uh, filters. The, these uh, higher order filters will act to eliminate a good deal of that out-of-band energy and allow the converter to operate without saturating on that, that large out-of-band energy. Here's uh, an example of a digital filter that's used inside of a sigma delta converter, in this case the Texas Instruments ADS-1274. And you can see that this uh, filter has a very flat passband uh, and extremely sharp uh, transition from passband to stop band and then a deep uh, stop band attenuation of about 100 dB. So these filters uh, are very uh, selective. Um, Again, it's a digital filter, so it's, it's uh, realized in, in an algorithm on digital data um, as opposed to using op amps and capacitors and resistors that, that we use to build analog filters.
Well, the step response of the ADS-1274 uh, looks like this. Um, you have quite a bit of activity as a precursor to the step function. Um, so, so lots of ringing and undershoot as a precursor to this unit step function. And then when the step comes along, you have overshoot and ringing. So this type of uh, transient behavior uh, in response to transient signals uh, make these converters problematic when we're dealing with shock type signals. So one thing we can do to address the the poor transient response of a sigma delta converter is to again use a higher order uh, front end analog filter such as uh, one of PFI's uh, pulse mode filters, the LP4P or the LP8P and we can set the uh, cutoff frequency to be uh, equal to the sampling frequency divided by 10 or in other words sample it 10 times the cutoff frequency. When we do this the uh, transfer function of the front end analog filter dominates the overall system transfer function and the step response is dictated by the filter. And here in this uh, particular slide we're looking at the step response of a, of a cascaded um, LP4P, 4-pole pulse mode um, analog filter at the front end for various uh, oversampling ratios. So for the red curve we're only oversampling at two times the cutoff frequency of the LP4P. Um, the gold we're sampling, oversampling at four times the cutoff of the LP4P and in the green we're oversampling at ten times the cutoff frequency. So you can see the green trace has an extremely well behaved uh, step response with uh, no perceivable overshoot or ringing. So this is this is something we can do if we have a uh, uh, a sigma delta analog to digital converter system we need to make a shock measurement with it we can't live with its uh, poor uh, transient response, overshoot and ringing. We can apply a front end uh, analog filter that does have very good transient response and oversample it. Okay, to, to wrap this up as a summary, uh, we talked about uh, transient response and looked at step response of uh, various filters and found that uh, the Bessel and pulse mode, the LP4 P and LP8P had uh, excellent step response. They also have very good phase uh, linearity and, and they're great uh, choices for time domain measurements. We also looked at the uh, step response of some sharper filters uh, like the uh, LP8F and found that those uh, are, are under damped, have lots of overshoot and ringing and uh, uh, may not be the best choice uh, for shock and transient type measurements. We talked about filter specs, um, amplitude accuracy, we, amplitude and phase match, talked about stop band uh, attenuation and uh, the ability of the filter to maintain that stop band attenuation over frequency. We also looked at uh, different filter specification uh, sheets and the graphs and how to interpret interpret the graphs on those spec sheets, specifically uh, PF's uh, spec sheets. Then we discussed uh, the distributed uh, gain amplifier and how to use that to avoid signal clipping when we're measuring signals that have lots of outband energy. We talked about uh, spectral noise and broadband noise and how to uh, go from one to the other. Uh, given uh, that uh, an assumption that the noise is white. We talked about the uh, referred to input and referred to output noise specifications and how to use uh, those specifications to compute um, broadband noise uh, at the output of a, of a filter amplifier. Then we moved into a discussion on, on aliasing we talked about two methods, uh, method one and two, for setting up the anti-aliasing uh, filter. We specifically looked at uh, a popular uh, converter, A to D converter that's used today, the Sigma Delta converter, and how to uh, 
set up uh, for anti-aliasing on that device. And the problem of uh, converter saturation when you use such a, a simple single pole uh, low pass filter for anti-aliasing. We talked about the problem of uh, poor transient response when using a sigma delta converter and how to improve, greatly improve the transient response using a uh, analog, front end analog filter uh, and oversampling that filter where the transfer function then becomes dominated by that front end analog filter. So that concludes the presentation today. I see that a number of you have chatted in with some questions and uh, Bridget has prepared some slides with uh, three or four questions so why don't we take those right now. The first question that came in is you talked about the step response as a criterion for evaluating transient response. What about the pulse signal inputs? Typically when we're measuring uh, pulsed signal inputs we're dealing with mechanical shock and using an accelerometer as a sensor uh, to measure the shock. The accelerometer has a natural resonant frequency and that resonant frequency can certainly affect uh, the measurement of the pulse. Um, a rule of thumb would be that the the duration of the pulse uh, relative to the uh, the period, uh, the natural period of the, the sensor should be greater than five or ten uh, to faithfully uh, reproduce and measure that pulse. Uh, similarly, um, the location of the 3 dB frequency of the of the filter used in the measurement system can affect the, uh, the measurement of the pulse. And a rule of thumb um, proposed by uh, Patrick Walter would be that the uh, the pulse rise or fall time, whichever is smaller. Typically these pulses have uh, asymmetrical um, rise and fall times. But whichever is smaller times the 3 dB frequency, that should be greater than uh, 0.45 uh, to faithfully uh, reproduce the pulse. The, the uh, filter of choice for measuring pulses would be um, our, our pulse mode low pass filter or uh, a Bessel filter, one that has linear phase and, and good uh, transient response. Uh, one last thing to to pay attention to when measuring pulse signals is, is uh, whether or not your uh, measurement system is AC coupled. Um, the AC coupling frequency relative to the pulse duration can cause severe underestimation of, of uh, shock levels. Uh, due to the drooping uh, caused by that, that AC coupling. The next question is, do filters with linear phase have good transient response? This is a good question. Um, all of the, the analog filters that we studied in this presentation, the, the Bessel and the pulse mode filter that had linear phase also happened to have good transient response and that was by virtue of the, the shape of the amplitude versus frequency response and how uh, the Fourier series of a unit step function is truncated by that, that ampl amplitude versus frequency response. Um, there are, however, uh, filters with linear phase. We manufacture filters with linear phase um, that have amplitude responses that are, are flat and, and sharp. And as a result, that the truncation of the, of the uh, step response for your series is more abrupt. And that causes uh, overshoot and ringing and um, undesirable uh, properties in the transient response. Uh, similarly, we, we talked about the sigma delta converters um, in this presentation and the digital filter in, in the sigma delta converter that we studied and for 90% of the, the sigma delta converters on the market, those digital filters have linear phase. Um, but because they have such a, a sharp, abrupt uh, transition from pass band to stop band in their amplitude versus frequency response, um, the truncation of the Fourier series of the step function or any other 
um, transient input, uh, this this abrupt truncation will cause a uh, loss of uh, overshoot and ringing. So that's a long answer to say that um, filters with linear phase do not necessarily have good transient response. Why do you only include an overload detector at the input to the filter? What about the output? When the signal is overloaded at the input to the filter, it's not uh, often readily apparent to the user uh, through observation of the signal at the output of the filter, since the filter does a very good job of masking that overload condition. The overload condition is very bad. It can result in zero shift in our signal. It can result in frequencies appearing in our, in our signal that aren't really there. Uh, due to the non-linearity of the amplifier when it's overloaded. So as a measure of uh, data validity, it's important to know that the input to the filter is not overloaded. And that is why we put an overload detector always at the input to the filter. With respect to the output, um, the output is visible uh, to the outside, to the user. Um, the data acquisition system is sampling the output. And if that happens to be overloaded, uh, there is visibility um, to that condition. So that is why we typically don't put an output overload detector in our instruments. Thank you, Doug, and everyone on the line for joining us today. A recording of the talk will be available on our website. Uh, please stay tuned for information on future webinars.